Thank you people that are viewing this video. You'll probably see it first on Freeman TV Raw. Um, my name is Garrett Ian, as many people know, and I'm here with, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Ethan Glover. And you are a recent mover to New Hampshire? That's right. Yeah. And before you moved here, you were kind of keeping an eye on the activities that were going on here and also giving your own commentary online. Sure, so you yeah. expand yeah. on that. I had a, a few criticisms of, um, at first it was the whole the Robin Hooding thing and the uh, the harassment of the uh, the meter maids. It seems like that could have been handled a lot better. So I just put my thoughts out about it out there. And most of your your commentary related to Robin Hooding was it directed at any specific individuals? Uh, yeah. There's. I mean, I try to get to everyone, but Cantwell and Ian were, I think, the two prominent ones in, in that that one. Yeah, so um, I myself have been a vocal critic of Chris Cantwell since around the time I moved to Keene. Before yeah, yeah. I had moved to Keene, I had lived in Concord and I had known who he was. Um, I had seen that he had done an introductory blog on Free Keene um, for a 420 event. Um, but he was not, I guess he was never officially a blogger. Um, now, he, when he left New Hampshire a few years ago, um, Ian Freeman, the founder of Free Keen, um, one of the bloggers there, of course, I'm also a blogger there, uh, identified Christopher Cantwell as an advocate of violence, based on yeah. his words. Now, Chris Cantwell in that time has not revoked or apologized or withdrawn any statements he's made. As far as I know, he doesn't do that. No. Um, so, at some point, people in Keene, Ian and others, have changed their opinions about him, not based on him changing his positions, but based on their own changes of position relative to what is peace, what is advocacy of violence, etc. Well, then you get people just kind of getting used to Chris, you know, that that's just the way it is, it is and you kind of have to accept that, so you kind of just, people get, I guess, indoctrinated with the guy. Some would say that's almost cult-like behavior, to sort of excuse, uh, excuse a transgression because of some sort of credit that one has. Yeah, that's, that's definitely, I mean, he gets, his, his blog and everything isn't really that big of a deal, but he certainly gets attention, and I think people want to like him, and so they, they look for any reason to, and they're willing to make a lot of excuses in order to uh, consider him as a friend, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting uh, if somebody's, uh, that's almost like to say that if someone is doing the same transgressions outside of one's presence, if that's all they see is the transgressions, they'll already form an opinion of person beforehand, but in Chris's case, you've made some claims against him that I feel that others have sort of blown off or ignored, uh, specifically that he's committed theft, uh, that he's committed fraud, um, that he's lied about how much money he makes, that he's lied about um, uh, just past instances. Um, do you feel that there's a reason that uh, people aren't, either haven't, is it possibly they haven't heard the claims that you've made, or uh, that... Are there others that, uh, you know, verify some of that information? Well, the person who came to me with, like, the, the biggest accusations, like theft and everything, the first time he tried to say something, he actually kind of made the mistake of doing it in a comment section on Chris's website, and that resulted not only getting banned, but he got a lot of harassment right back at him, and um, there was threats towards his family and everything from his fans. That's, that's sort of the kind of fan base he has. So he wanted me to, to kind of act as a voice, and that's... I just told what he said to me. And um, is this the person who uh, allegedly was a victim of theft from Chris, or is this somebody who was the person in the video, the bear mace? Yeah, this is a, the guy he went to in the middle of the night and threatened with bear mace over a Facebook argument over like a joint Facebook account the guy had. Mm -hmm. Do you know if that person ever shared the uh, information from like that Facebook argument, or if there's any redact like chance that people could see the redacted original discussions that Chris had with these people? I'm not sure. I think there might be someone that has screenshots, but I think the conversation is probably gone at this point, like the actual live version. Mm -hmm. Because that is something to consider that many people will consider something gossip until there's some sort of physical yeah. evidence presented of it, like screenshots and, uh, and yeah, I mean, uh, or at the very least, like you know, some evidence of the theft. But Chris has his own blog of the event, and I think he's 
showing some information from that, and he doesn't hide the fact that what he did was because of just a sort of argument on the internet. Bobby, Bobby, why are you calling um, the police, Bobby? You now, I think that leads to a very interesting discussion about escalation of force, whereas he, he claims this person was threatening him online. Um, I haven't seen the conversation. I don't know if they were. That probably should have shared that in the beginning of the video, whatever the threat was, but he didn't in the video that I saw. Um, but yes, it very much did disturb me when I saw the video that where he goes to someone's house in the middle of the night, bare mace, he runs onto their lawn like he's yeah. violating their property rights, which is allegedly like the one big no-no of an anarcho-capitalist world is not to occupy property if the owner doesn't want you to. Um, now, that, that, that uh, incident, that is something that is kind of ignored, uh, overlooked by people. Um, do you try to have you tried to like address that specific issue with people and like what have their what responses have you seen to that when you try and address it? Um, anytime I bring up anything about Cantwell, it's kind of like, well, you know, he has this these things in the past, but overall he's a good guy. You know, I talked to the person, he's really not that bad. So I think most of the time conversationally he isn't you know, with his friends he isn't too bad, but he's he's still, you know, every week he's got some sort of stuff that happens. <laughs> I was a manager, we called them ministers at the time, prior to there being a Shire Free Church. There was no religious connotation there. Um, I myself was a minister of the CAC along with Daryl W. Perry and uh, Ian being the property owner at that time uh, when there was one decision to actually ban Cantwell from the property as opposed to him not being a member or not being a guest or whatever. Right. Um, and that was based on uh, issues that were brought to my attention from a member about things he wrote relative to the Gabby Gifford shooting. And he was sort of applauding this violent act that occurred that even resulted in what Cantwell would consider innocent victims, like a young child that got shot and killed in that incident. Um, and he was applauding the fact this violence happened, but he was saying he wasn't advocating it. He was just enjoying the fact that it occurred. Sure. And um, to me as an activist, I, I felt that that very much mur muddied the waters of what it meant to uh, value human life, um, and to value human rights, that just because somebody disagrees with you on guns or something doesn't mean they should be shot and that it's some sort of like great act right. of karma. Yeah. Um, I felt like that sort of public relations uh, image was important to people at some point, but as I said, like the, the importance of that may have like, may have disappeared over some time, but. Yeah, he actually had an article where he said, there were two murders of two cops up in uh, New York, and um, some people were saying that was leading to a drop in arrest. It turns out there was like a protest going on of the mayor, but he was saying that that did more good than the libertarian movement has ever had done in its entire history. When That's I, quite a claim. When I asked um, why he wouldn't go around killing cops in, on his website, someone said basically Cantwell's too important in order to do that sort of thing. So. It's kind of like a, a cultish red flag. Maybe he was trying to get his, his audience, but I, mean, I don't know what he's trying to go for there, or, or if it's just shock value, you know? Well, um, this is something interesting I see about uh, sort of pseudo-anarchist communities. It's real folks that consider themselves anarchists. I mean, I hate to be the one identifying the real anarchists or anything, but yeah. um, the idea that one should oppose hierarchy and rank and structure um, and have horizontal organization um, and that is something that is lacking when we see with like Cantel, there's almost like a regiment to it where people will say that the ideas he's spouting are good but that he can't do them because he's too important. It's almost like this yeah. sort of uh, figure is being created as though it's an intellectual figure. And he's an, he's an intelligent person, I will give him that. He can, you know, formulate words well, but um, making claims like you, you pointed out that's very, uh, that lacks a lot of sociological analysis and cultural analysis oh, yeah. to blame like it to make such a judgment over two groups of uh, factors on society, um, and especially considering that there, were, as you said, there was a larger issue going on there than the murder of those police. Yeah. Um, now, one th uh, another thing I wanted to bring out about your your claims about what was going on with Cantwell um, in the article, there were three articles that I thought had some significance uh, to this discussion. One you posted on January twenty second, or at least that's when it was dated. How not to sell libertarianism. Yeah. yeah. And it seemed to be mostly a critique of Cantwell's approach to Robin Hooding. Um, there were some things in that article I thought maybe were written under the impression that Cantwell was officially associated with Robin Hood of Keene when he never really was. Right. He was interested in what we were doing and came around and did his own thing pretty sure. much. Okay. 
Like he was, uh, yeah, just to clarify, he was never invited by Robin Hood of Keene like to come out per se, um, yeah. as, as far as like myself or James as the people involved at that time go. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, you know, maybe Ian invited him out, but you know, at, we, we yeah. pretty much had open invitation for anyone to come out and you know, do the activity. Yeah, how not to sell libertarians, and that was kind of like, um, I was using Chris as the example of kind of bad publicity, putting by bad publicity on the, on kind of the movement, because, you know, you're trying to go for shock value, just trying to get the views instead of actually reaching out to people that uh, might want to make that switch over into libertarianism, you know, they're on that, that fence and they just kind of need the help for the, the push. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I must say that I find it easier to critique some of Chris Cantwell's other activities aside from his participation in interacting with parking enforcers. Yeah. Um, I'd say that was some of the lesser offensive stuff he's done. <laughs> Uh, but it brings out a good point that just because somebody is uh, like laughing or playing along doesn't mean they necessarily you know care to. Yeah. Uh, but it is, of course, part of those people's jobs. Um, now, uh, in the case of like protecting free speech, I want to make sure that while we're doing this long critique of this one person, that we also respect their right to do what they do as long as they're not harming others. And in the sense of free speech, I support. Uh, Chris Cantwell's right to make a parody Antonio Bueller site. I support his right to make a parody Stop Free Keen site. Um, but a good issue that you raise is that you were censored when you revealed the source of these satire sites. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, basically when I went on this, on this Facebook wall and showed these people who actually believe Antonio uh, Bueller.org is, that's Antonio Bueller's website, I showed them that's actually Chris Cantwell, then he almost immediately banned me uh, from that and I emailed him about it and asked him why he banned me. He says, if you want to buy ads on my site, or if you want to advertise on my site, buy ads. Um, I mean, I offered to do that, but uh, <laughs> it was kind of funny that he was, he was uh, first he was claiming that I was advertising my website. It was just kind of a link to show um, the owners of the website to, to like, this other tool. And um, that, he's, that he thinks I'm trying to spam him because of that. When in reality, I think he's just trying to trying to keep on this this whole fraudulent thing he's got going with Antonio Bueller for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that an, another thing that sort of pseudo fraudulent uh, mentioned briefly was that he represents himself in dating profiles to be making X amount of money. I think I've seen one that said between uh, fifty and sixty thousand dollars a year. Yeah. And yet at the same time he was posting on his uh, blog that at the end of, as a signature almost, at the end of his blogs for a while, I'm in desperate need of cash, please donate. Yeah. Um, have you, have you had a chance to uh, check out M.K. Lord's article, Libertarian Welfare Queens? No, I haven't. Alright, so that was written at the end of 2014 and I think it was a very good critique of certain uh, figures in the movement. Um, in a sense, you could say it's almost like an internal cleansing that there's a sort of critique going on. Some people call it infighting, but mm -hmm. I think all discussion is healthy as long as it, it doesn't get terminated uh, undu unduly or get misdirected. Sure. Yeah. Um, but the Libertarian Welfare Queen's article pointed out that uh, of many people like asking for money, um, asking for donations to continue something, um, yet are advocating for... Uh, things that they don't like, Chris Cantwell, um, Stefan Molyneux, advocating like people break away from their families, um, and not saying that it's like a bad for people to make that decision for themselves, but right. Um, so yeah, I would strongly recommend that article for people like on this subject because Cantwell is mentioned, and um, at the same time, like it's not a, it's one thing to critique someone is not necessarily they're, they're like wronging someone. Um, you've brought up instances where Cantwell has actually wronged someone, and yeah. I would say that, like, for all of the arguments that should be made, there should be some prioritizing as far as like when someone's doing something wrong versus when someone's wronging someone versus when they're just being mildly offensive. Right. Yeah, a lot of um, a lot of what I've done with Cantwell at this point is it's mostly a joke because I've, I've tried to reach out to him and um, talk to him about um, things and. If he were actually willing to sit down and talk with me, I'd probably remove most of that stuff. But I, he's, he's kind of what I call a Molyneuxian isolationist. So if he finds one thing he doesn't like about you or makes up one thing he doesn't like about you, he just completely isolates you, refuses to ever have any contact. Mm -hmm. And I would have to concur there is uh, after we asked him to not return to the CAC based on his positions on uh, violence, 
that, uh, yeah, I was blocked by him and uh, I totally ignored. I mean, I have had some idle conversations in passing with him. Um, we've both been at the same lunch before and sat near each other, but yeah. Um, otherwise, I find that sort of approach, it's not a very, uh, I mean, it's a fine approach for an individual to take, like it's their right to take it, but as far as activism goes, as far as trying to be like a community builder, I think it's um, you know, very awkward. I find it very inhumane yeah. sort of to ignore or like refuse to talk to somebody who's not a threat or like not harming you or like unless they're actively continually annoying you or something. But. Yeah, he, he likes to burn bridges whenever he gets a chance and I think eventually he's going to end up in a place where I, it's just him and he's got you know, nobody left. Uh, but he tends to stick to people who he thinks might be helpful to keep him um, relevant close to him and he's those are the people he's willing to talk to privately and apologize to but if he thinks you're weak or something he'll just bully you completely out of his life mm -hmm. um, now one instance where I found almost that I had to you could say defend Cantwell was uh, an instance in which he felt he had to pull a gun on there were three people that were running towards him yeah um, now I must say about that video I felt that there was to a large extent that he wasn't really doing anything in the wrong there. He was walking down the street, he observed some trouble, he was safely, uh, for himself, safely removed from the situation and documenting it without trying to interact with them. Um, it, he then became the subject of it. Um, I must say that, like, as far as his actions in that video, I would not have acted differently with the exception of the fact that I generally don't carry a gun, mm -hmm. um, especially not open carrying. It's something I used to do, um, but I'm just not interested in openly, you know, displaying for others that I have a weapon anymore. Like, I don't see a reason for that. Yeah. Other than that, I believe in the right for people to do so without being threatening. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's just, a, like, one point of contention, I'd say, of your, of your critiques of Cantwell was it seemed that you were very much, in your articles, critical of his approach to that situation, when in, in actuality I feel that he's almost commendable in that situation in the sense that he doesn't use any physical aggression. Um, he displays a firearm. I mean, he, it's unfortunate he didn't use it. He didn't, felt he didn't have to use it. Do you have any, you know, commentary there? Well, that video wasn't that big of a deal to me. You know, I, I probably would, like myself, I wouldn't have recorded um, at all because you could. It's pretty easy to pick up when people are just having an argument and when someone's, you know, actually having trouble. Because, you know, when they realized he was recording, everyone either told him to stop or. Uh, the other person step behind the car to try and hide from the camera because they don't want their personal business on the internet or on a recording. Um, yet, I mean, the woman charging him, she wasn't in the right, but I don't think Cantwell was, you know, 100% there. I mean, and that's, that's kind of the same thing Cantwell did to somebody else. I think the very next night someone recorded him and he uh, ran at him and attacked them. Are you speaking about an uh, incident with Graham Coulson? Yeah, yeah, I do. Okay, um, that was something I noticed that on your website that video is no longer avail uh, available. There's maybe one or two videos that really? I think the huh. links have since been removed. Maybe a fan of Cantwell or Cantwell himself like reported them as harassment to YouTube or something, I don't know. But yeah. um, and, and that's not like claiming that he did, I have no idea, I'm just saying. Right. Um, that was uh, actually, uh, there's a video of myself interacting with Cantwell downtown one day. I just happened to see him and wanted to ask him questions about his interactions. He had been living across the street from me at the time. I no longer lived there. He no longer lives there. Um, but uh, he had had interactions with this guy, Matt Schmidt, who's recently been making a name for himself around yeah. town through his, yeah. his public arguments with JP. Um, so my, I wrote a critique of Cantwell about uh, how he and this other neighbor were competing for the Worst Neighbor Award. And uh, my uh, approach to that is like he he does some things like I try to give, you know, one thing I'm concerned about is like when we when we address people's misbehaviors that like we're you know fair to them and that what they do good is addressed and so I tried with that article to say like what he does well like trying to approach his neighbor initially like calmly and like speak to him mm -hmm. but then eventually like yelling and cursing at him and yeah. doing these unnecessary things before storming off. Um, from your perspective, I mean I guess I can't ask how you've seen others change that are like in his presence, but like, um, I don't know, from your perspective, do you feel that uh, Cantwell himself is ever unduly accused of, uh, like, negative behaviors? I guess some would say that he was tied to, uh, 
uh, a, a public like nudity issue that that would, like occurred. I don't really need to name any names there because like <laughs> nobody. I think all the parties involved would rather die out. But um, yeah. he was like accused of releasing these photos of someone, and I guess he he did actually have nothing to do with it, from my understanding. So, other than what I just pointed out, do you feel like he unduly or anyone else like unduly gets negative attention based on their positions internally? I think. At this point, because there's such a huge history of all these things Campbell has done, he's kind of free game. You know, I, w- I would, you know, drop down on him and then kind of uh, be a little nicer if he would actually talk to me person to person. But he doesn't. He doesn't do that. I think he enjoys being hated, and I think he likes, you know, that that sort of bad attention. Mm-hmm. And I'm willing to do it just for the fun of it. Um, but I, there's there's certainly a lot of th- uh, gossiping r- going around where people do get um, negative attention when they don't really deserve it. And uh, what you were pointing to about wanting to be like the most hated, I'd say that's probably evident with uh, his use of the N-word recently that yeah. was uh, you know, pretty famously shared. Now that actually did result in some action as far as associates of his distancing themselves publicly um, in the sense if he was removed from Free Talk Live indefinitely, who knows if he'll be back, if when. Um, but and I think that was mostly Mark who pushed for that. Um, I, I can't imagine that Ian would, that would be his decision, or like that would be something he would vote into. Because they, they those two seem um, pretty fairly close. Well, I've heard that the argument was that advertisers would begin dropping from the show if there was an N-word guy on the show. Yeah, definitely, and yeah. It's funny because, like, it, many people may know the South Park episode where Randy uses the N-word on TV and he becomes, like, famously known and, like, sort of ostracized for it. And um, the, the episode is about how this sort of ostracism is wrong at the same time as, like, the... But, like, it doesn't make the word okay. It, it, so it's, it's, it's such a very complex thing that uh, Cantwell's just of it... Personally, I, I don't feel like it makes any sense as justification for using an epithet because somebody else uh, called him white. And right. I, I mean, if, if anything, he could say that he could call them black back, but then to, I'd say, escalate to use, uh, to use like, profane language, uh, profane epithets. But, um, yeah, that's one of those things. It's like, should it be the words that make people ostracize and back away? Like, I'm glad that people are calling to attention, like, his bad behavior, but... I almost feel like it's really uh, a disappointment as far as where things stand that it has to get to a racial level. Um, like the violence wasn't enough or the violence has been overlooked yeah. before there's uh, any sort of like internal uh, uh, internal perspective on this. Well, I think that probably brought, um, brought the issues home with Free Talk Live because if Mark thinks there's a risk of losing advertisers, then it becomes much more real for them than you know being able to just make excuses for the guy and move on. Because mm-hmm. then they have to continuously deal with him being on the show and advertisers being suspicious of him. So it was probably better for them to just kick him out. Um, I think he recently became a member of the CAC again. So he's, he he's definitely still um, a part of that circle, I guess you could say. Right. Um, well, as you know, I guess it's worth pointing out for this, since I did mention that I was involved with the CAC previously, that I have not been a member there. Um, Somebody paid for my membership about two months ago and wanted me to vote on some things, and I did because they they asked me to, and I felt it wasn't unimportant. Yeah. Um, but other than that, you know, uh, my association with the place has been less because of the the change in policy is not based on the change of the actors who were previously deemed to have caused problems, um, or at least presented problems. Um, so another another sort of critique I wanted to make of your approach um, was that I noticed in, in one of your articles I think it was the uh, the King uh, the King Baby article you have a picture of Cantwell in the nude some people may uh, yeah. there may be some level of shock value there that draws people away <laughs> and there was also some commentary about his vagina stinking. <laughs> Um, do you think that maybe posting that sort of thing leads people to believe that what you're posting isn't that serious and that it's more of an, it's intended to be an attack piece or intended to be a hit piece? Yeah, there's definitely a, a weird mix in there where I've got all these serious things and I jump into just joke things that I'm making up. Um, it's kind of hard because I don't take Chris Cantwell very serious at all, but I've got people that talk to me and they've got these kind of terrible stories and, uh, like the guy that's you know talking about how he was stealing and he's been arrested for rape and all this, and I I can't verify that stuff, but I'm willing to put his voice out there along with my own side by side, 
and just put it all in the one thing. So, uh, having been arrested for rape, uh, is it your your contention that somebody, or is it your contention or somebody else's contention that Christopher Cantwell was arrested for sexual assault at some point? Yeah, apparently he was arrested for rape. Whether it actually happened, that's a different story. And um, uh, apparently uh, his brother was arrested for sodomy as well. That may have been related to the same event. And this was all in New York before he was a part of the movement when he was a, a drug dealer and all that. And I think he's been pretty fairly open about his past, just not, you know, with these kind of stories. Is there a way to verify any of that information with criminal background checks? Or I imagine that costs money. Yeah, well, I would imagine you can buy into a check and find some sort of stuff, but even that, it's, it's not always, uh, it doesn't always tell the whole story, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, those are pretty serious allegations. Um, uh, people just pass them over. I would like to hear Chris respond to them, but it sounds like yeah. rather than responding them, he's choosing to just ignore or discredit the people yeah. addressing them. Yeah, and I originally uh, started to get into all this because of the, he made claims against me about how I hacked his website. And, uh, at first, I was just trying to talk to him about it, and he refused. So I started building up in this uh, this case against Cantwell because I figured as long as he's going to lie about me, I'm going to tell these stories, maybe create a few lies on the side and, and create this, uh, this whole tale of uh, or, uh, Chris Cantwell. Hey, it's Johnson. So, um, One thing that I, I found sort of interesting too about your uh, your writing is you're, you're essentially writing a blog, but you say on there I'm not a blogger. No, it's, I update it like maybe once a month, just whatever's on my mind at the, at the time, I throw it up there as a place to put it all together. It's okay. certainly not meant to be like a regular thing or a, a professional thing. It's just a, just kind of a, every once in a while I've got something to say, so I say it. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of, one of the things you said about uh, Robin Hooding is that arguments are for teenagers who don't know how to communicate. Holding up signs and filling parking meters are for people uncomfortable with the idea of outreach. Um, would you say that like Robin Hooding itself isn't really that much of a form of outreach? Because I would contend that there's a lot of people that, because it's a public activity, they see what you're doing, they interact with you, they ask yeah, questions. Yeah. And I've got I don't have a huge problem with Robin Hooding, or really much. Like I mean, that's great people doing it, but I'd kind of like to see um, a little more active outreach. Like my suggestions for uh, for uh, Robin Hooding was to actually talk to business owners and try to do a petition so they can take over those uh, parking meters and start to make that movement towards privatizing and you know go through the court system and all this and at least at least there you're stepping towards something rather than um, just trying to give people information I think it, I mean everyone's always trying to share what they think and it's just you know a lot of people talking <laughs> mm -hmm. all right um Another thing sort of Robin Hood related uh, to bring up about Cantwell is um, you've another, just to sort of clarify like uh, background that maybe Cantwell, this is sort of an instance in which maybe Cantwell's getting blamed for something that he didn't really have anything to do with. I'm, I don't believe he interacted with uh, Alan Givitz, who was a former parking enforcer here in the and ended up quitting his I thought he was an alright guy.